17th chapter of John. The message this morning is called Welcome to My World. And Pat has already reminded me that was a popular Jim Reeves song years ago. I hadn't even thought of that. I've thought of that sometimes as people say it kind of in a byword. When, when something's going wrong, they're like, welcome to my world. <laughs> but the message is welcome to my world. Keith, Keith, has, uh, Keith has already read a scripture this morning from, uh, well, it's from the pen of John too. I've heard it called this way before. You know, you got, you got big John over here in the front, the gospel according to John. Over in the back, you got three little Johns. He read from the first letter of little John where, where um, God, through John's pen, says, uh, Love not the world, because the world's full of a whole bunch of sin, right? But over in Big John, we've got verses like John 3, 16, that says, God loves the whole world. So there must be different worlds going on at the same time. I think the one over in Little John is like the, the, the things of the world, the world system, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and all these things that make it up. That, that's... One word that's describing different things, but yet there are different worlds going on among us here. Let's read this scripture verse to start with here for several verses, beginning with John 17, verse 14. This is from Jesus' high priestly prayer where he prays for his church the night he's betrayed before he goes to the cross. And uh, basically, almost all, yeah, every, if you've got a red letter Bible, Everything but the first introductory sentence in John 17 is read because that's part of Jesus' uh, priestly prayer that he prayed for his church here. But we're going to take some verses right out of the middle of it here. And he's praying for us. Remember that, church. He wasn't just praying for the church that was the disciples that were around him that night, but he was praying for the church of all time. And that's the, Jesus was praying for you that night. In 1714, he said, I, I have given them thy word, and the world's hated them, because they're not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. I, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil or preserve them through it. They're not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them or set them apart through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the word of God. Help us to preach it and meditate upon it. and We worship you today. In Christ's name, amen. And apply it to our lives. And let it become a part of us. Uh, here's my message this morning. I got to think about this earlier in the week. I was out in the woods doing something, and I, I, I came to one of those uh, serendipitous discoveries. I, I, I thought, I don't have the answer, but I am beginning to see the problem. And I'd seen something on TV. You know how it is. You see something on TV anymore, you've got to go to the woods. <laughs> Get away from that stuff. And you get to thinking about it, and so I, I don't have the answer, but I, I, I am beginning to see the problem. And here, here's, the, here's what's going on in our country. America is not just a great big nation, that's a true statement, but America is different worlds inside of a great big nation. And, and that's where all the conflict comes from. And have you noticed that American politics is really ugly? Nobody's going to say amen to that. <laughs> Democrats and Republicans both say amen to that, right? Amen. But, but here's where I've come with that. You know what? The ugliness of our politics is really what makes us great. What do you mean, preacher? Well, I, I think it was designed that way by the founders, that, that, that there's two sides to issues. There's always going to be two sides to issues. And during the two sides to the issues, both sides have a tendency. There'll be extremes on both sides, and there'll be moderates on, on both sides. And, uh, and it, it hit me. You ever think about this? The, the middle is really what runs things. 
Now, I'm not in the middle. I'm not saying you should be either, but uh, I'm just saying the middle is really what runs. Because like, the middle is in our country is kind of like this. You know, they're, they're, the, they're the few people that are liable to vote either way, depending on an election. And that's really the swing votes in all of them. You know, they'll look at the Republicans running things for four years or maybe eight, sometimes 12, and then they'll say, Shh, I'm going to vote Democrat next time. And then sometimes it's the Democrats, they'll be in four years, eight, maybe 12, and then they'll say, I'm going to vote Republican next time. And that's what controls things. The rest of us, we're in our trenches, and we vote the same way all the time. But that's because uh, we, we've got um, different worlds that, that we live in, these two, two extremes. And there are, there are I, I'm not saying you should be in the middle, because I, I'm not in the middle. I used to think I was extreme on the right. In the recent years, I found out, man, I'm not as extreme as I thought. I used to think all the crazies was on one side. And I've, I've come to realize, man, there's crazy people on both sides. <laughs> and they're in powerful positions. But I still believe that it's that ugly process that makes our country the greatest country on earth. And I do believe that America undoubtedly is still the greatest nation on earth. And I'll back that up by saying I'm not seeing people clamoring to get out of this country. I'm seeing people from other countries clamoring to get into it. If you, don't, if you think it's bad here, think what it must be other places when these people are willing to give up and do anything to get in here. So you look at this great nation that we live in, though, and you say, how in the world are we so far apart in our thinking? And this is what hit me the other day when I went out the back door and went down to the woods and did a little bit of work. I thought, I can walk out my back door, and in 25 feet, I'm in the woods. And if I wanted to, I could stay in the woods for days, weeks, even months, or the rest of my life. And there's... I mean, there's, there, there's my property, there's the Cherokee National Forest, 650,000 acres. That's just one big forest that borders a forest on the west and forest on the north and forest on the south. I mean, there, there's still a whole lot of country in our nation that if you're walking around out there in it, there's nothing that tells you it's not 1850. And that's my world. That's the world that I think of when we sing, This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. That's my Father's world, but he lets me live there. But yet, there's people that the world is totally foreign to, and these people in these big cities, they live in an entirely different world. They get these high, you ever wonder why cities have such high concentrations of sin? It's because all human beings are sinners. <laughs> and the more human beings you get in one little bitty area, the more sin is going to be concentrated in a little bitty area. And then the sin is going to run rampant and it's just like, a, it's like crazy, you know. Well, New Orleans, Louisiana is now the murder capital of our country. They've passed up uh, St. Louis, Baltimore, and Detroit, who's right on their heels. It's interesting to me that they all, all these things, they have one thing in common. They're, they're run by these big liberals that are administrations that are soft on crime. It seems like anytime you're soft on crime, you're going to have more on crime. If you put the fear of God and the fear of government in people, they'd think a little bit more before they go out shooting up and murdering people anyway, I, I guess. But uh, I, I don't know. But then I watched that even in our own state, we've been all in the news here lately with the Tennessee Three, which I, I watched that and I thought it's a whole lot like a few years ago when I preached at this pro-life rally up here on the other end of town and and there was a old boy there, he, I, I'll never forget him, he had long hair and uh, big rings hanging off his face and everything. He had a sign hanging up there, and every once in a while he'd turn it. And he was 100 degrees opposite of everything that I was preaching. <laughs> but I, I, one of the first things I said when he was standing there quiet with his sign, I pointed him out. And I said, uh, I, I disagree 100% with this fellow right here. I said, but buddy, I will fight for your right to stand there and do that. 
Peaceful protest is what our country's built upon. That's right. But we've seen an awful lot of crossing the line lately. When the, the summer of, a, of the looting that went on in the name of peaceful protest, that's crossing the line. You've got a right to protest. You don't have a right to destroy other people's personal property. You don't have a right uh, to government property, January 6th. You don't have a right to do that. And with the Tennessee Three, that's kind of what I felt like. They had a right to stand outside to protest with the people that was out there. But when they came inside and disrupted the session and walked right down to the well with the bullhorns, that's, to use a word that's been used recently, and I condemn January 6th, the Sunday after it happened, that becomes insurrection. But if you look at the Tennessee Three, you think, that's Memphis, that's Nashville, and that's Knoxville. It's these big cities. They live in entirely different worlds than I do. And you get to think about that. When you live in a different world, even things mean different things to you. When I hear the word gun coming from the world that I come from, I get happy thoughts. I get endorphins. I think of growing up as a boy and spending time with my dad shooting rabbits and squirrels. People in one of these other worlds, they hear the word gun and, and instead of endorphins, they get adrenaline and it scares them. And they think of somebody they saw dying on the street that was shot up or a school shooting or, or somebody in their family that was lost or robberies. Or, they think of all the bad things that have happened with guns. It's because we live in different worlds. To me, I kind of look at it like a, I like chainsaws. And I think of chainsaws, and I think, oh, yeah, I like that one. I like to have that one. And happy times that I've spent in the woods with chainsaws, you know, and, and because that's the world that I'm from. But other people, their only exposure to chainsaws might have been, they saw that movie, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So when I hear chainsaw, you know, I'm excited in a happy way. When they hear chainsaw, so, oh, no, <laughs> we ought to outlaw chainsaws. <laughs> but that's kind of how I look at it. You know, guns and chainsaws are both just tools. They can be used for good or they can be used for evil. You can kill people with either one of them. And, and, and it's kind of like I, I think the devil's on this gun thing like uh, we don't want to talk about the people's hearts and the people's sin. It's like a, it's that bad old gun. Instead of there's a finger pulling that thing that's connected to a heart that is just as dark as coal. And I don't think you can legislate guns out of our country. There's too many of them. And if you did, the only people going to turn them in is going to be the good people. All the bad people still going to have them. And if you were able even to take every gun off the market and every gun out of, the, out of the bad people's hands and everything else, it ain't hard to make guns. You can make guns in the basement. Jesse Holder was one of the best muzzleloader builders there ever was up here in Coker Creek, Tennessee. And he just had a little wooden building out front that he, he built them out of. They ain't, nothing to, they ain't nothing to do but pray. It ain't the guns. It's the hearts. And it's sin. But when you get in these big cities, sinful cities and you get into the, that kind of extreme way of thinking, everything goes. And you get into the extremes running things. And then the next thing, you know, it's like, what are we going to do about all these pregnancies? Kill them. What are we going to do about, the, uh, uh, we, 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 we can't have people saying anything against sodomy. Do you know that's where that word comes from, Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, we're going to pass laws like can to make it illegal to talk bad about people committing sodomy. We're going to call it good stuff. You know, if we're going to kill babies, let's, let's call it, uh, they won't go for killing babies, but they'll go for women's health care. Them people don't want us to kill babies. They, they're trying to take health care away from women. And then we want to take these six years old to 12 year olds, and, and we, want to, we want to, if they're tomboy or something, we want to change their bodies to a different sex. We're going to mutilate them. But people won't go for that if we call it mutilation. Let's call it uh, gender affirming care. I mean, who's going to be against gender affirming care? 
people might be against mutilation, if we call it that kind of stuff. How did we get to such a place? Used to people that had that kind of confusion, and I'm not being mean, people that had that kind of confusion is we got them in an institution and we gave them some help. But somewhere along the line, it's like you don't need your mind transformed, you need your body transformed. But you know, people's mind needs to transform. Our minds transform, church. We began to think different when we became Christians. We began to think different when we were washed with the, the washing of the word. The Bible says, be not conformed to this world. See, that's what going along with all this sin is. You're just conforming to this world. That's what John's talking about when he says, don't you love that world? It's full of a bunch of sickness and filth and sin. Don't be conformed, Romans 12, 2. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. See, the Bible talks about something being transformed. By the renewing of your mind. If you messed up in your thinking, you've got to be changed in your mind. It's not, if you've got a sick mind, you don't change your body. You fix your mind. And it's like a lot of things today. It's like when we support people in their sins, that's not loving people. We, we don't want to be mean to people. We don't want to be cruel to people. But when we start all this stuff that we're going to affirm people in their sins, it's like we decide we're going to pat people on the back while they go to hell. Isn't it more loving to say, Here's what the Bible says. God loves you and God don't want you to be like that and God forbids that. But you're thinking wrong, but God can fix that if you'll submit to God. There's something called counseling that's been forbidden anymore, I guess. But that's, that's biblical counseling. We can't have that in this world that we live in, I guess. But when we look at all this crazy stuff, though, just remember there's two worlds going on. I'm glad that in our state, most of us, we're still about God, country, and freedom. It's changing quickly, but the church is the answer to that. There's two different worlds, and that's where we're living at. And that's why the Bible says that we have to go into that world. But don't be like that world. Because if the church just becomes hermits and abandons the world... The world is going to hell in a handbasket and it ain't got any hope. The hope of the world is the church. And when the church capitulates to the world, we're speeding quicker and quicker into the great tribulation. It's just going to get worse and worse. So if we go into that world, how, how, do, we, how do we witness to that world? How do we be salt and how do we be light? We always go back to Mama, the Bible, right? That's our instructions. Be kind. Love one another. Because the church's witness is not in screaming and yelling and being mean to a world that's lost and confused. That's why God doesn't love the things in the world, but he loves the world. And he gave his only begotten son that the world can be transformed. The, the, God, the, the solution to the mess that we're living in is not politics. The solution to the, to the mess that we're living in is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I, and I think the church, the American church, has jumped track on that sometimes. That the gospel is still the solution. Transformation of the gospel beats legislation in every issue. When you're led by an inward grace instead of an outward restraint, that's changing of society. And God loves the whole world. Not just those who look like us and act like us and think like us. God grieves over sin, but God God's not willing that any would perish, but that everyone would come to repentance. 
Now, hold on to that thought. God loves everyone, but that don't mean that everyone's going to heaven. There's, there's a key word in there, too. Everyone has to come, come to repentance of. We'll never make any difference on the world until they make it, until they know that we actually care. And meanness don't show that we, that we care. Let's go over these verses once again here, and I'm going I'm to bring them out one at a time. John 17, verse 14, Jesus' high priestly prayer for, for his church. And I want you to notice how I want us to feel about the Bible the way Jesus felt about the Bible and feels about the Bible. He, he prayed for his church, but verse 14, I've given them thy word. That's the key. When the Bible is neglected in society, and when the Bible becomes just another book or a book that most people don't believe, then you're going to see a mess in society. I've given them thy word. And if you stand up for the word, what's going to happen? The world will hate them because they're not of the world. The church is not of the world. Even as Jesus said, I'm not of the world. Now, we kind of feel this way sometimes. I wish I didn't have to live in this old kind of sinful kind of world that's all tore up and fussing and fighting and everything. But Jesus says, I didn't pray that you'd be taken out of the world, but you'd keep them, you'd preserve them from being touched by the world. They're not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Sanctify, set them apart from the world. How do we set, how, are, how is the church set apart from the world? Well, let's see what Jesus says. Through God's truth. Truth is not what somebody else says it is. Truth is not opinions. Truth is not something that's voted in. Truth is what thus saith the Lord, and it's settled forever. Thy word is truth. Jesus said, as you've sent me, as he's talking to the Father in his prayers, you've sent me into the world, even so I've sent them into the world. They may treat you the way they treated Jesus too, church. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself. Jesus set himself apart from the world by being sinless, that they also might be sanctified through thy truth. The church is going to be set apart from the world by following God's book, thy truth. That's where the truth is. The sad thing is, a great deal of the 21st century Christian church is simply the world. And they, they, they'll say just enough to make it look like they're really the church standing for God's truth. I listened to Protestant Hour coming in this morning. AM 1220, WCPH, Etowah. 8 o'clock to 8.30, I'm on the road getting the truck turned on and listening to Protestant Hour. I've been on for decades and decades, and they get, they, they get these preachers on there that are getting farther and farther and farther away from the Bible. And first of all, I was a little bit interested this morning because the guy was preaching on the, uh, Luke 24, 13 through 35, which is exactly the scriptures I preached on last year, the Emmaus Road, last week. But he came down through there, and he was talking about the, the love of God and the love of Jesus. All that's true, see, right? And then he talked about how a fellow had lost his father, emotional appeal, and a guy came to him in his church. He was concerned that his dad didn't go to heaven. And the preacher said, I told him, I told him, uh, did you love your dad? He said, well, sure I did. He said, would you let your dad into heaven? Well, of course I would. Well, God loves your dad even more than you do. Sounds good, don't it? Sounds good, don't it? But that is a theology that don't have room for a bloody cross. God is love. But God is just. And the only way God ever allowed anybody into heaven is because God punished sin on Calvary's cross. What kind of gospel is it without the cross? <laughs> well, well, here's what theology does. If you've got a gospel without the cross, then you've got some kind of uh, 
child abusing father God that sent his son down here to get suffer on earth and be going to a cross where they killed him because there wasn't any reason because God already loved everybody and they're just going to heaven. That's where we're living at. There's never, maybe preachers have said this since the first century, but I'm going to continue to say it if they did. I can't see that there's ever been a time in history more important to know your Bible and to be strong in the Word of God than it is now because you're getting bombarded from the world, but you're getting bombarded from the world disguised as a church too. God does love the entire world. God is not willing that any should perish. God raised up a church to be a witness to that world and told them to be kind and be loving as you're being salt and being light. But there's no pointing anybody toward heaven without pointing them toward the cross of Jesus Christ. God save us from opinions today that are drifting farther and farther from the word of God. Help the true church to rise up, Lord, and to be warning folks that uh, you're not going to take this sin lightly. And as the Bible tells us that uh, I believe a soon coming day that Jesus is coming back for that final battle in flaming fire, wreaking vengeance on them that know not God. Help us to stand for the word of God. And Lord, if we're not willing to stand for the word of God, then Lord, just help us to get out of church and profess to be the atheists that we really are. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.